All right. So, final, really final one, exam preparation. Sorry, this has to be right in the middle of the exam period. Uh, as I've mentioned, everything's been a bit messed up this year. So, um, let's see. Just uh, a few organizational things as usual. Um, to, to recap how the, the grading looks like, I already mentioned this in the beginning, just so you remember. We have two completely separate grades, one for the assignments and the project and one for the exam. And for each one you will get 50 points and we also have a few bonus points in each case. So you, the, the absolute maximum you can get is maybe 53 or 54 in each case. Um, half of the uh, regular maximum is required to pass, so uh, if you get 25 points then you will get uh, 4.0, which is just the passing grade. Um, and for both ones you need uh, a path passing grade on its own. Uh, the final grade is just average, and if you pass one but not the other, then you can just uh, keep the, the grade until next year and do the other one uh, individually. So if you pass the uh, assignments last year but not the exam, for example, then you can just redo the exam and uh, keep the assignment grade, just like most, mo most courses do. Um, exam itself will be on July 27th. I already mentioned this a few times. Uh, it will be 90 minutes. Uh, so it's actually two hours here, but uh, we'll take a few minutes to pass out the sheets and to collect them afterwards. So the actual time to write will be 90 minutes. So um, what's really important, I think, is that we don't won't have any uh, programming questions. This is what the uh, what the assignments and the um, project have been for. Uh, the exam will really focus on on understanding. So it's also not about learning everything uh, by, by heart. I already mentioned this. It's uh, going to be an, an open book exam. Um, so I, I don't really think that it makes sense to learn all of what I wrote on the slides by heart. It's much more important to, to look into uh, the, the understanding and the, the connections between the topics. So you can bring anything on paper, which what you want. Uh, the exam will be in English, but you can, of course, bring a dictionary if you want to. Uh, you can bring your own notes, you can bring printed lecture notes. What you can't bring is basically anything with a screen or with uh, Wi-Fi. So no smartphones, no smartwatches, no tablets. Um, um, I know it's maybe a, a lot of paper to print everything, so you can also, I think the font size on the slide isn't that large, so you can pr print two slides on one sheet, more, for example, and save a bit of paper. Um, if you actually want to bring them, maybe you already printed them and wrote your notes on that, so that's perfectly fine, you can bring all of that. Um, okay, so... I've brought a few sample questions, which we will look at now. Um, the questions in the exam will look somewhat similar. There are a few questions which you can basically, um, when you know the right, the right slide or the right place to look, then you can answer them more or less directly from the slides. But uh, that's not the point of having an open book exam. So uh, most of the questions will more be about understanding the, the different connections between the topics. And for that reason, there's often no one correct answer. So there can very well be several different answers. And for that reason, it always, always makes sense not to just write down three words as an answer, but also provide why you think this is the right answer. And that's also why we have 90 minutes. So you have a, a bit more time to, to write down what you actually think why this is the right answer. And this is much more important, in my opinion, than just uh, learning everything by heart and copying onto, onto paper. Um, all right, I think uh, then I'm already at the uh, example questions. Any, any questions about the exam modalities, grades, and so on? No? Or, yeah, question? No, okay. Then, yeah, maybe I, I think the uh, best way to do this is I've wrote down how long I think you might 
approximately tape for that question. So maybe just take a sheet of paper uh, and think about how you would answer that. I know you maybe haven't had a lot of time to learn yet, but uh, maybe you remember from uh, enough from the lecture. Uh, just take a sheet of paper, write down what you think is uh, is the correct answer, and then we can discuss uh, discuss it together in uh, five minutes. So your your turn. <laughs> Hmm? The what? The example will be here or in the uh, Neither, in the in Straße. Uh, uh, it's also on the slides, so. <coughs> Okay, that's four minutes, four and a half. Does anyone have a suggestion how to how to start? So, what what would be at the very bottom if you think of it as a stack again? What's the lowest uh, layer protocol or the lowest layer standard that's involved? Come on, any suggestions? <laughs> uh, 
Link layer, no, not almost. What's Internet. below? Hmm? Internet layer? Uh, no, no. <laughs> Internet layer is so is already higher up in the stack. What's at the very bottom? Yeah. Yes, exactly. That's the right one. So, so the, at the very bottom is actually the hardware, of course. Somewhere the, the transmission has to happen. And uh, if it's a Wi-Fi network, as, as indicated in the question, then it will be something from the 802.11 standard family. And the first part is uh, usually called the physical layer, so that's just the hardware. And on top of that is what uh, uh, you mentioned, the, uh, the, the link layer, that's actually uh, called in that context, it's often called link layer control. So this is the, the management layer that uh, basically talks between uh, the, the uh, laptop and the access point, for example, and does channel assignment and that kind of stuff. So link layer is kind of correct, but in this case it's a bit more specific. It's again part of this 802 uh, standard. And so this is the hardware part basically, and this is the, uh, the protocol part. Uh, what's on top of that? Now your answer is getting in the right direction. You mentioned internet uh, layer, but it's not... I IP, exactly. So next one would be IP. Um, on top of that, TCP. exactly, TCP, and, and, and finally HTTP, exactly. And if you, so this is, this is the, the protocol stack uh, in the, as viewed from the internet point of view. If you uh, look at it from this OSI point of view, then the layers have slightly different uh, names. So we have physical, data link, network, transport, and application. And um, the OSI stack actually has a few more layers. So there's presentation on top of that. That's up to discussion. That's also not part of the question, actually. That's just for, uh, for background. Uh, and um, just one more side question. If it would be a secure connection, HTTPS, how would that change? Do you remember maybe? Yeah? It would be in, in between um, the transport and application. Mm -hmm. Exactly. So we would simply get another layer in between here. Which one would that be? Do you remember? Um, SSL, yeah. That's the old name. Actually, now it's called TLS, but it's more or less the same standard, so SSL would also be uh, okay as an answer. So that would simply be another, another layer in between here. The rest would, would remain exactly the same. And that would kind of be a session layer here in, in the OSI model, but again, this is kind of outdated, so most people just refer to the, to the uh, stack on the left. Um, let's use the opportunity. Any general questions about networking, which you might already have? We also have time, time for general questions later, so um, if you don't have any, let's look into the next sample question. So this is actually one which really is about, uh, about thinking about the problem. So five minutes is maybe a little too long, actually. So let's just take a few minutes to think about this again. I, I've mentioned in one of the last lectures that usually if you use GPS, then any moving object or any object that's, that's tracked by GPS is just represented as a point. Can you think of an example where this might actually be a problem? So take, take a few minutes to think about that and then we will, we will discuss this.
Okay, any ideas? Yeah? I think maybe the most obvious scenario would be using this point in the map or the navigator where the map never represents the direction where the person or the object is facing. Mm, okay. Yeah, that's, well, that's still, that's kind of related. So, uh, which, which one does that? Because I think Google Maps actually, doesn't it show a little arrow if you turn yourself? Mm, I was using this application in uh, FireOS, which is Amazon. Oh, ah, okay, okay. So and they... And they had the map application without a direction. Ah, okay. Okay, yeah, that's kind of related. Um, any other suggestions? Any other ideas? So, the, the idea for this question actually came from a news story. Uh, I'll show you a picture. <laughs> so, here we have a GPS receiver, which is a point. Here we have a road, which is, I don't know, two and a half meters, so no problem, right? <laughs> well, maybe, maybe not. So, this is actually um, the reason why there are uh, specialized navigation systems just for trucks because they know that trucks have a certain weight and if you just use uh, Google Maps or something where the, the moving object is just a point then it doesn't care about uh, the, the space the object needs and if you use a Jeep uh, GPS or just your smartphone to, to drive around your truck then that's exactly what's, what's going to happen because it, just doesn't care for if, because if you're uh, just uh, uh, walking around on foot or driving a small car, then it doesn't really matter. But if it's a truck, then suddenly this kind of thing happens. And um, for that reason, it's of course a simplification if you just represent it as a as a point like object. And if you're a regular user, then you don't want to to enter the exact width of your of your car every time you uh, you navigate somewhere of course but uh, if you have a big car or a truck then this uh, can actually turn into a big problem and um, yeah for that reason you usually have have specialized um, specialized uh, nav navigation systems for uh, for trucks for example um, we can continue discussing this right away. So can you think of something, and actually your, your answer kind of relates to that. Uh, do you, uh, another scenario where even if you know how big the object is you're navigating around, where that might not be enough. Any ideas? I'll show you a picture again maybe, just to, to continue the discussion. So, similar problem. Maybe you have one GPS receiver here, and you have one here, and so no problem, right? <coughs> yeah, maybe not. <laughs> so, um, why would this happen? So, maybe we can just discuss this now here without uh, taking extra time. Why would something like this still be possible even if I know how long and how, how wide and so on the ship is. Do you have any idea? Yeah? Maybe the system is supposed to be at the center point of the wave. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, that's related. So, um, so you, you basically, if the GPS receiver assumes the ship just ends here because it's in the in the center you mean mm -hmm. yeah something like that and it's also um, there's also an additional problem which is that the um, the direction and the angle isn't that accurate usually so um, if maybe that receiver thinks that the direction the ship is going is more like this then it would basically assume that the bow is maybe something here somewhere here and it wouldn't be a problem um, so, if you have a really large vehicle like a ship, then the, the inaccuracy you get might might add up over the the um, just over the length of the ship. So, 
what would be an easy solution for this? Instead of uh, just having one GPS receiver, maybe use two or even more. Um, of course, if you're uh, using, if you're having something like a huge ship, then uh, you usually also don't use just a regular smartphone-like GPS receiver, but you have more precise ones, which are of course a lot larger, which have a big antenna on its own. But even then, um, it wouldn't be sufficient to to just have one here uh, on the bridge, but you would also need a second one uh, up front because otherwise you wouldn't really be able to to actually to actually navigate uh, navigate properly with the ship. Um, okay. Any questions here about that scenario about GPS in general? Maybe not yet. Okay. So let's continue different sample question. So that's again one for you to, to think about for a few minutes. So um, we talked about uh, fitness trackers, for example, and smartwatches. We talked about privacy. So now let's combine the two. How could a fitness tracker I'm wearing every day uh, be used to, to compromise my privacy? And think of a few examples how that, that might happen. And I think, yeah, we can take five minutes again for that, so um,
So, any ideas? Yeah? Uh, first of all, the fitness tracker collects the biometric data of the user. Mm -hmm. So, let's assume that the person has some problems with his health, for example, mm -hmm. so it will be reflected in his, his biometric data. And this data is probably being uploaded to some server of this mm -hmm. fitness tracker company. So, it's highly possible that then the user might have the uh, contextual advertisements in his browser, like you have a problem with your heart, with mm -hmm. the doctor. Okay, yeah, that's a good example. And yeah. also, if this data is, is online as well, it could include the location data. So, mm -hmm. they move running from one place to the other, and then the person who's snooping can see they're outside of their house. So they mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, yeah, um, very good point. And many uh, fitness trackers uh, do not encrypt the data, so mm -hmm. it's quite easy to attack. Okay, yeah, that's also a good point. Other ideas? So I think you mostly covered the, the examples I, I came up with. So you usually have some kind of cloud service in the background, and yeah. even without health, uh, you could just get uh, lots of advertisements for fitness products, maybe, because the, the cloud provider might just sell your data to some advertiser. Um, then the cheap fitness trackers don't encrypt. That's exactly true. And sometimes they even s send out broadcasts all the time. So you could see where the user is and then maybe tr actually rob their house while they are out jogging. Qu actually quite, quite a plausible scenario. And the final one, you could use the sensor data to, to make some inferences about the, the health of the user. So that's just about exactly what, what I also thought about. So um, there may, of course, be other ways and combinations of those. Um, but these would be three, three reasonable answers, for example. All right. So let's look into the next one. Um, this one would require a bit more background. I don't know. So since I don't know if many of you have uh, your um, uh, print out, printer out ready, it doesn't look like so. Maybe we can do this one together because uh, for this you would need to, to actually look up how the critical algorithm works, and it's not something I expect anyone to know off the top of their head. So this was in uh, lecture eight, I think. Um, so the idea is you have this mesh network and uh, between all nodes where there's an arrow, they can basically hear each other. So if this node sends out a broadcast, then these three will, will receive it. And for this one, it's these, these ones, for example. Um, and now the question is when I have these parameters for the algorithm and I introduce uh, a change at um, at this node A, um, then how long will it take for the entire network to actually know about that change? Um, so let's look if I, I think I have that somewhere here. Let's look into the IoT lecture briefly. And there's something about here's trickle. So we have three values. Um, we have an interval, and we have this redundancy constant, and we have a few a few rules. And the most important rule to to solve this uh, uh, this question would be he, this one here. So every time uh, a node receives uh, data where it's uh, it uh, recognizes that the data is not consistent with the state of the node, then it will, whatever else its state will, uh, will be, it will reset the timer to the minimum interval and start again. And as soon as the um, timer has expired, then it will send out a transmission. And um, so now let's look at the mesh network again. So this is basically the only rule we need in this scenario um, because we just uh, want to know at what point have all nodes gotten the new state. 
it would be a bit more complex if we want to know at what point do all nodes stop broadcasting again because for that we wouldn't actually need to keep track of this uh, consistency counter and so on uh, but in this case actually we just need to basically look at the minimum interval there's a bit of uh, interpretation uh, because the question is kind of uh, what does node A do if uh, the new data is uploaded? Is that an inconsistent state or not? Um, but let's assume it is. And in that case, um, so what will happen is, if you look again at the, at the rules, as soon as we realize an inconsistency, the timer will be set to the minimum interval and restart it. That means, in that case, Timer will be set to one second. And uh, so at time zero, the change happens. Then node A will restart the timer with one second. And after one second is over, then it will send out the new state. Um, so these two nodes will then receive the new state. And then exactly the same will happen with those nodes. They receive an inconsistent transmission, a new state, which they haven't had before. New, basically a new version of the state and so they will also um, reset their timer to one second let the timer run for one second and then broadcast so after exactly um, two seconds these two nodes will broadcast then these two will receive it um, uh, after two seconds, after three seconds, these two will broadcast, same scenario, and then these two will receive it, and after three seconds in total, all nodes will have gotten the new state. It's a bit up to interpretation if, uh, so how you, how you interpret the change at node A. Will it um, wait two seconds in the first place, or will it just wait one second? The, the interpretation I just talked about will treat all nodes equally, and the, as soon as the change is introduced, then this will be an inconsistency for node A. Uh, if you assume that it will wait out the initial interval, two seconds, then it will in total take one second longer. And so the answer would be, three or four seconds, depending on how you actually interpret the first node to, to react. So this is, I think this is an example of why it's important to also provide a bit of background. So if you just write down three seconds, then that's correct. And I can give you uh, uh, points for that, but it's not entirely sufficient. And if you write down five seconds, then it's just wrong um, because it, would be too, too high a value, and, uh, but if you provide your, uh, the way you arrive at that answer, then you can get still points because maybe you just made one mistake in between somewhere. Um, and then you can still get nearly, nearly all points, for example. So this would, of course, be something which you uh, need to look up in your, uh, in your notes. So um, the as I've already said, I don't expect anyone to know the Twitter algorithm uh, by heart, which is it's just too, too much, basically, in my opinion, uh, if you can always look it up. Um, but for that reason, this might also be a, the, the kind of question that we can actually have in the lecture, because you can look it up, and then you just have to think about uh, when what happens at each node at what uh, point in time. So you could also draw a little timeline, for example. That would also be a nice way of answering that question. Um, so yeah, that's that's another example. Any questions here? Any comments? All right, then I think we one more, ah, yeah, exactly. So this is again one uh, which you can take a few minutes right now to, to think about. So uh, why are these various effects we talked about very early in the lecture, reflection, diffraction, refraction, and so on, all these physical effects, why are they usually not good for wireless communication? And how can you turn that around? So. That's also one for, for you to take a few minutes now.
So, any ideas, any suggestions? Maybe first part first, what negative effects do these have? Yeah. Well, my guess would you start with the reflection, diffraction, refraction, basically the properties of the radio wave when it travels through the space. Mm -hmm. And then uh, basically the wireless connection is the connection using the radio yeah. waves. So when we have all this stuff going on, we just have the waves scattered, changing the direction, mm -hmm. and everything else. And well, when it's in uncontrollable, it will definitely lead to the mm, not that stable connection, mm -hmm. well, weak connection. Okay, yeah, that's basically it. So. Um, if you look at it from a kind of physical point of view, so all of them cause some sort of interference. So uh, the wave arriving, the, the waveform, radio wave arriving at the receiver is either just uh, uh, attenuated by some material in between, or it's maybe uh, reflected somewhere else, and then you get two waves arriving at slightly different uh, uh, times uh, two waveforms and then they of course make maybe cancel e each other out and the end result is that uh, this signal to noise ratio at the receiver gets lower and if it's below a certain point which is different for every receiver but uh, it's it's always there then uh, it simply will start to uh, to cause errors or not receive anything anymore um, so that's the big disadvantage if you have relatively simple receivers. Um, and But now on the flip side, how can you actually use these to your advantage? Does anybody remember maybe? We also covered this pretty early on, yeah? I don't know, I mean, I think there are some reasons that person, I don't know, would really like to have his signal distorted. Uh, in some sort of a protection mm -hmm. signal? No, maybe not. not. Not so much, maybe. Okay. Um, I suppose it might be good for certain obstacles, like if you were in a, a network company and you wanted to, for example, reflect a signal towards another direction, you wanted to yeah. you know, go to an angle, go around the mountain, for uh -huh. example. Yeah, that's, that's actually a good point. That's a good, uh, good example. Um, so that's, of course, uh, a specific scenario perhaps where you um, really need a, a specific reflector somewhere, uh, for example. But there's also uh, a, basically an everyday scenario which actually most of, we, most, most of us use every day. And this is this, uh, if you maybe remember, this multiple input, multiple output receivers. So just about every um, modern Wi-Fi device has at least two antennas and it can use these effects to create different paths, different signal paths to the, to the access point, for example. And uh, so one path is going straight, one path is reflected somewhere. Um, and if the uh, receiver also has different antennas, which all, almost all modern receivers have, then you can actually use uh, both of the signal paths in parallel and get a, a higher throughput than you would get with just one single signal path and one single antenna. So that's the, uh, the, the trick basically to get, actually get an advantage out of these um, negative effects. Even if you have one perfect uh, channel, um, you can still outperform that with, a, with th such a kind of, of multi-antenna receiver because you can just use two maybe less perfect paths in parallel. Um, yeah, and again, just about any modern wireless device has at least two antennas and uh, really high performance ones may have up to six, for example. So uh, if you have industrial grade access points, they can actually have, yeah, I, I think up to six antennas uh, in, depending on the uh, scenario. Okay. Any questions about this wireless stuff? All right. So, um, yeah, I guess we're done with the sample questions. Now there's 
time to ask anything you want. So I've, I have all the lecture slides here. Did you? I, I don't know if you actually already had a lot of time to to look into that, um, or if you've been busy with other exams. So. Um, Anything at all you would like me to, to provide a few more details on maybe what you found unclear in the in the original lecture, anything. I think it's on the first floor, but there's also a, a couple of signs. Uh, so have you never been there in that building? No? So it's, it's, it's on the first floor, I think, um, and there's also signs. It, it's so maybe maybe arrive a few minutes early because it's really an old building and it's maybe not that easy to find actually but I think there's uh, uh, a couple of signs in the hallway which which point you there and I'll also be there a little early so um, I'll walk around and see if I can find any lost people and <laughs> Anything else? Yeah? For lecture, lecture six, we don't have any meetings? No, uh, right. Lecture six, that was context, right? Um, exactly. Now, uh, that's basically, I, I want, still want to record it, but it won't, won't be part of the uh, exam, so I won't ask anything about that because, yeah, I re really didn't cover it at any point, so that's, that's not going to. to uh, be relevant actually. So you can still have a look there and if you have any questions I'll answer them but I'll, I won't really put that in the exam because yeah, kind of fell off the, the back. <laughs> mm, yeah, more, yeah, mostly. Well, I, I may have skipped a few, so I, I think it's a good idea to keep the slides open in parallel because I'm not sure if you can really read all, everything in the YouTube videos. If you can, then that's perfectly fine, then I think everything's covered there. Um, but it's probably a good idea to uh, have a look through the slides in parallel because I might always have I have skipped over some minor points uh, while talking, so that's... But in general, the YouTube videos should, I think, cover uh, hopefully at least 90% of everything. Um, yeah, also, if you watch the videos and have any uh, questions about... Uh, so if the audio quality isn't, isn't that good or something, then uh, also please post in the forum and I'll try to fix that. Um, it's m maybe, yeah, I, I think most of them are, are actually pretty decent. There's one or two where I had to use a different microphone and so the audio quality might not be quite as good on those, but it's, I think it's still understandable. But if you have any issues, tell me as soon as possible so I can, can try and fix that early on. Um, yeah, I'm also also not sure about today's video actually because again different camera so um, let's see how that turns out but um, I'll also upload it later today. You had a question? Yeah, um, maybe it could be that I don't have a strange question but like how many, how many questions should we have in the meeting then? Um, I found that here's like we have four or five questions right now and it's like the average time is all in like five minutes. Yeah. So I guess it differs from one person to another. Yeah, sure. Thinking about the scenarios and stuff. Like so uh, very, very rough estimate. So we have um, uh, 50 points in total, and it's 
maybe very rough guideline would be to that you have between one and two minutes for each point and so it will be um, around maybe yeah six points per question so maybe eight questions in total and for each question you should very roughly uh, think maybe 10 to 15 minutes so that's the, the but there I, I'm usually subdividing the questions so it's not one big uh, one but rather each question is one topic and then there's two or three uh, smaller sub questions yeah Um, I'm usually, so I'm giving you like uh, not extra sheets to write on, but you can write directly on the sheet with the questions and there's also space on the back. So if you write very large, but in general, it shouldn't be more than half a page for, for a question. So if you, if you have a very large handwriting, then you can just continue on the back, but uh, it um, shouldn't be basically a whole novel <laughs> or something. So one third of a page, half a page at the very most. Yeah. I mean, it sounds there is about two takes of notes, but you use the exam thing, or? Um, notes about the exam, you um, mean? Yeah. Oh no! You can you can bring whatever you want on paper as long as as it's on paper. It's open book, so so you don't have to limit yourself to one page. You can just print out the slides, for example. Or, but uh, yeah, just to to repeat that, I'd like to encourage you to print them at least two slides on one page, so it's not that much paper going down the drain. Um, should uh, the the font shouldn't be so small that you can't read it anymore. Other questions? Anything? So um, I'm guessing that most of you haven't really started to, to go through the, the lecture stuff yet again because of the other exams. So um, if you have any additional questions between now and next Wednesday, Please do post them on the on the message board. Um, that's what it's for, and then everybody else can also see the answer. So I'll try to to answer that uh, really quickly. Um, yeah, apart from that, I guess any any content questions. Yeah, of course, if you haven't had time to learn yet, then that's of course difficult. All right, well, I guess in that case, well, uh, la last call for um, um, evaluation sheets. Does anyone still have one lying around? Or still want one? No? Okay. Well, in this case, now we're really done. Thanks, and yeah, good luck. See you next Wednesday. <laughs>